The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome, uh, for the first time, New York State Senate Majority Leader John Flanagan. Senator Flanagan has represented the second Senate district, which includes Smithtown and parts of Brookhaven, Huntington, uh, and Suffolk County. Since 2002, he has won overwhelming re-election every time he has been up. Uh, he has followed his family's footsteps. Uh, his father, John Flanagan Sr., uh, served as an assemblyman for over a decade. This past spring, Senator Flanagan became majority leader of the New York State Senate and continued to fight for the issues that have always been important to him, issues like tax relief for his constituents and for small businesses, budget reforms to improve the state's fiscal health, and improvements in the quality of education here in New York. And I know he is a passionate supporter uh, of organ uh, donation, which I'm sure he will mention. Senator Flanagan, Flanagan uh, with the start of your first full legislation session underway, we look forward to hearing about your vision for, the New, York, for New York State and for your priorities for the year ahead. So without further ado, please welcome on stage Senator John Flanagan. My water, the uh, last thing he said was good luck. <laughs> Can always use good luck. So uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much. Very happy to be here. And um, I consider myself actually very lucky and privileged to be serving in the capacity that I do. So I take what I do very seriously, uh, really try and work hard on behalf of the members of our conference. And as I'm coming in, you know, obviously you get to meet and greet a lot of different people. And I'm right in, uh, right in the eye line of former Mayor David Dinkins. So if I'm saying the right thing, he's going to shake his head up and down. If not, this way. But, Mayor, it's always good to see you. And I'm um, listening to the job titles. You have president here, president there, chancellor here, chancellor there. You're all important. But I just met someone who has the coolest job that I never heard of before. And he works at CUNY. And he's a professor of Irish. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Mulro and I are sitting there going, why the hell couldn't we get that kind of job? <laughs> anyway, on a um, very serious note, to uh, Bill Rudin and to Abney and to the staff at Abney, thank you so much for having me here today. And yes, it is my first time having the opportunity to speak before you. So let me go through a <clears throat> variety of different things. If I may, I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. And it's good to see the chancellor here from CUNY, because I met him up in Albany recently. And the poor guy had <clears throat> something wrong with his eye, and it was all bloodshot. And I'm thinking, that was even before the budget came out. So this is <laughs> he seems to be recovering. So um, it's, there's a lot of different things that I want to talk about, but I want to stress a couple of basic things, one of which is that I am very proud to be a New Yorker. I am very proud to be a public servant. And I'm very proud to work with thousands of talented, dedicated people, both in the public and the private sector. And I have two people that I work with uh, with me here today, both of whom are very important to the functioning of our conference and, in my estimation, to the functioning of New York State, one of whom is Kelly Cummings, who is our Director of Communications. She's the one that helps me stay on message. And equally, if not more important, is our Chief Counsel. I'm not sure where she's sitting, but that is Beth Garvey. All right, just remember that name, because when all the negotiations are going on, she's going to be right in the middle of them. And she's really good at what she does. So in speaking about the state, one of the things that I think people lose sight of is the diversity of our state just within our own conference. We have members from upstate, downstate. And just as a recognition, our conference has more uh, scope, if you will, around the state of New York. We have people from western New York, the southern tier, Mohawk Valley, the north country. Uh, Utica, Syracuse, and they're not all the same. 
They're not all the same. And we have very detailed, lengthy conversations about public policy issues in our conference on a regular basis. And at the beginning and the end of the day, one of the things that I am desperately trying to stress, both internally and more importantly, externally, is the well-being of New York State. And by extension, the well-being of New York State is directly tied to the well-being of New York City. I love the city of New York. I love the city of New York. And I'm amazed at how many things are going on here all the time. Quick story, um, when I was in college, I worked at the Fulton Fish Market. Gary, you'll be happy to know I was a member of the Longshoremen's Union back then, all right? And it was probably the most interesting job I ever had because it was, you talk about a slice of life. But my point was, I just told Kelly this this morning, I had an interview for a job in Virginia and it was at a bank and the gentleman who was interviewing me was looking at my resume. He didn't care that I had a degree in economics. He didn't care about other things. He wanted to know about the Fulton Fish Market. Now for anyone who lives in New York and who understands that, if you're telling that to somebody in Virginia, it's not that easy to explain. <laughs> but what I really said was it was a perfect example of the fact that the city never sleeps. Remember that old phrase? And it's still true today. There's always activity going on. You know, I'm trying to sleep this morning and can hear construction outside. But if you hear construction and noise going on, that's probably generally a good sign. So going back, we are clearly one state. We have a lot of things that we need to work on. I think there are things that are going well, things that can go better. But as we move forward, that theme has to be consistent. And again, I'm going to repeat, the city of New York has a critical role in our economy and the short-term and long-term well-being of the great state of New York. And if we forget that, which I have no intention of doing, that's going to create problems. And I'm also very happy to um, work with my colleagues from the New York City delegation, Senators Golden, Senator Lanza, and Senator Felder, all of whom play a critical role in our conference. And you should be mindful and know uh, very clearly that they are not shy. When it comes to advocacy, particularly Marty, Marty Golden, everyone knows that. Uh, he's 24-7, but in a good way because he raises things that need to be raised, and he talks about issues that are important to his constituents, not only in Brooklyn, but across the city of New York. So now we're at a point where, for the last couple of months, whether I'm out or Speaker Hasty, or to some extent even the governor, there's been a lot of talk about theory and proposals in an abstract, but now we're at a point where we're talking about reality. Now we have an executive budget. So now when we talk about the minimum wage, we're actually looking at a real proposal that's come from the executive. Now we talk about things like infrastructure and the MTA and highways, roads, and bridges. We're actually looking at cogent details and having to uh, examine them through a, a vetting process, which is obviously very important. And I want to speak to some of the good things that I think are in the governor's budget and some of the things that I think we need to take a very hard, critical look at. But I want to be very, very clear. I have every intention, as do my colleagues, of working closely with the executive, with the assembly, with the city, because it all matters. And we have a political season confronting us that's going to come fairly quickly. But right now, people expect us to work together, get our job done, and then we can get into the politics in the latter part of this year. Okay. <laughs> all right, so a couple of good things. Um, environmental Protection Fund. The governor has raised that to $300 million. That's valuable for every community across the state of New York. That's a very positive thing. The governor has proposed a $2.1 billion increase in school aid over two years, and I'm going to put that in the category of it's a good start. We will add money to that, and a top priority of our conference is the elimination of the gap elimination adjustment, which has a direct correlation to the quality of schools, the quality of the education that our children receive, the level of property taxes that people have to pay. So we have the property tax gap. But when we properly fund education, we mitigate the burden at the local level. So last year, we put in $1.4 billion. Governor put in just slightly south of a billion as a start. My uh, feeling is that we are going to get north of that considerably. So uh, I've made that very clear in every venue and every opportunity I've had to speak on those types of issues. Um, having said that, I think we have to be mindful of the people who actually pay the bills, the taxpayers. And you're all, all taxpayers. I'm a taxpayer. I'm mindful of that. I know what my property taxes are. I wish they were lower. Everyone wants to pay lower property taxes. So when we look at the budget in a global sense and in, in an isolated way, I could probably pick out, and any one of you could pick out a program and say, this is good. 
That's good. That's good over there. But when we look at that in total, we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And that's the part that makes me nervous. So when there's a discussion about $100 billion in infrastructure, but only really $29 billion on the table to finance it, I'm not sure where we get the other money. And that's not to suggest for one moment that what the goal is is not laudable. But at some point, we have to figure out, is this bonded indebtedness? Are we going to raise taxes, which we are not planning on doing? Those are the things that we need to discuss. When we talk about the MTA, uh, last fall, in the latter part of the year, there was an agreement between the mayor and the governor, uh, about $8.3 billion. A billion dollars has been put in. There's $7.3 billion, and there's not a lot of detail on where that money is going to come from. And for me and for our conference, and this ties into the whole idea of one state, we have to have parity with highways, roads, and bridges. The needs of New York City are not only meant by proper financing of the MTA, but the city of New York enjoys the benefit of a, a good plan for highways, roads, and bridges as well. So a five-year plan, fiscal discipline attached to it, and figuring out how to pay for it. That's the hard part. The easy part is coming up with the projects and the plans and things of that nature. Then there's a proposal about homelessness and housing. Um, $20 billion over five years. And I, do I want to come up here and say I'm against housing? No, of course, and I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to say that we shouldn't address the problem of homelessness, but we have to figure out how are we going to do it, how well can we do it, and how are we going to pay for it. So those are just a couple of things in terms of the budget. But we have, and I'm going to repeat this because a lot of people seem to forget this. There's always this clamoring that there's backroom negotiations and all that kind of stuff. We have a very long, open, transparent budget process. Internally, we have budget subcommittees within our own conference. And we go at it. We go back and forth on what are our priorities. I just had a conversation with Amy about funding for ALS. There was $250,000 in the budget last year. Now it's out. That's going to be something that we'll be talking about. A number of our colleagues are going to talk about things that are specific and parochial to their districts, but the public process actually does work. Kathy Young is the new chair of the Senate Finance Committee. She was the chair of the Housing Committee, has now been elevated to that position. And the hearings that have taken place so far, I don't think one of them has ended before 8.30 at night. They've been going 11, 12 hours a day seeking public input. So let me quickly dispel the notion that somehow there is not input. And by the way, there should be. When we deliberate on these types of things, whether it's minimum wage or infrastructure or any other issue that is devoted to public policy, it should be a transparent process. It should be with a lot of disclosure. And we um, are very happy to be doing that. And we have a timetable that is tied to all kinds of different things that will meet our deadlines in terms of uh, revenue forecasting. And I actually am very confident, it may be bumpy along the way, but I'm very confident that we will have an on-time budget for the sixth year in a row. And at this point, nobody really talks about it anymore. And in a way, that's a good thing, because that's our responsibility. And in case anyone forgot, that's actually the law. So we're supposed to pass the budget on time. But when you look at different things, I want to use an example and put, sort of juxtapose it in a way. GE is leaving Connecticut and going to Boston. GE was courted by the administration, by the city of New York, but we couldn't get there, not for lack of trying. We couldn't get there because they made a business decision that the tax structure in New York is not an advantage to their company. You get to a point of saturation, and it's not just the city of New York, it's the state of New York. How competitive are we? How are we in line with states like South Carolina and Texas? And they are courting our businesses every single day. How are we in line with our neighboring states? You know, uh, Massachusetts used to be known as Taxachusetts. So if we lose to them, that tells me that there's got to be something that we need to do better. Now, in that vein, I'm going to raise a couple of different things and will and continue to do so. I'm not afraid to have any discussions. And I think part of what we are troubled by is when you raise certain issues, um, people tend to go, oh, my God, you, you can't talk about that. Anything that we need to talk about, we should. If there's a final resolution and a compromise, that's good. If we don't get to a resolution, that maybe is not the best thing. But the reality is that we need to have hard discussions. We need to talk about economic development. We need to talk about the regulatory environment in the state of New York. It's still too hard to grow a business in New York. Too many regulations, 
too much time, too many burdens, too many costs, too many fees, and we've made improvements. I'm not going to suggest for a moment that we haven't, but the people I talk to traveling all around the state, they're frustrated. And you can see it at the national level in terms of the debate and the tone and the content of the discussions that are taking place. There are candidates who are tapping into the nerve of the public, not only here in the state of New York, but across the country. So we need to be mindful of that. And our colleagues are not going to be afraid to talk about any of those different things. So having said that, let me use that as a segue to a couple of different issues. There has, last year, and this is sort of a little known fact, the Senate passed a property tax cap for the city of New York. It did not pass in the Assembly, which I'm sure everyone knows, but it passed in the New York State Senate. I started speaking about this months ago and listening to people who are working on issues like affordable housing. Affordable housing and housing generally, not only in the city of New York, but the state of New York, is a hugely important issue. I think we need to talk about a property tax cap. I know the city doesn't like that. I know it makes people uncomfortable. But I know the property tax cap has had real benefit across the state of New York. Taxpayers have saved money, billions of dollars. Now, New York State, we don't have a tax cap at the state level. We don't have a spending cap, and that's wrong. The Senate has passed a spending cap for a number of years. The governor has not advanced one. The assembly has not advanced one. If we're going to ask people at the local level to have that level of fiscal discipline, then we should be able to do the same thing at the state level. We've technically done that by virtue of the budgets that we've enacted and stayed below the 2%. But in reality, if it's good for everyone else, it should be good for the state of New York. And by extension, we believe that a property tax cap in New York City, who's enjoyed a multi-billion dollar surplus and whose taxes keep going up at exponential rates, and I'm listening to the people who live and work in the city of New York. I'm listening to my colleagues. I'm not making this stuff up. So when we talk about surplus like that, um, that type of discussion is very important because I think there's a direct correlation to things like that and affordable housing. When property tax, and I know people say the tax rates are not going up, but the assessments are going up. And they're going up very high on a continual basis. So the property tax cap is one component. It certainly can't be the only thing. There's got to be a lot of other things. Um, anyone, people always talk about the fact that nobody really understands school aid funding. I think I have a pretty good handle on it, but I don't know it as well as some of the people I work with. The tax system in many communities, including in the city of New York, the class system, how it works, those are discussions that we need to have because I think we can make improvements that inure to the benefit of people in the city of New York and to the people who are actually creating jobs. So a property tax cap, spending cap at the state level, we need to have those discussions. Um, Karen Hinton, who works for the mayor, tweeted because he was at the local government hearing, he was there for five hours. Nobody asked him one question about the minimum wage. About four hours of his testimony was de um, dedicated to the property tax. Now, if we had this discussion six months ago, I don't think anyone would have predicted it. But it was bipartisan. It was Assembly, Senate, Republican, Democrat. So it's a, an issue that's capturing people's attention. So property tax cap, spending cap. Mayoral control. Everyone's read the papers. I get it, hey? Yes, I met with the mayor this week. We had a very long meeting after he had, I did meet with the mayor, really. I swear I did, okay? <laughs> and I have every intention of continuing to do so. He is the mayor of the great city of New York. If Mayor de Blasio is doing well, that means the city of New York is by extension doing well. I have every intention of working with the mayor. Where we agree, and by the way, we have a lot of philosophical differences, but you can have cordial, diplomatic, detailed discussions about things that benefit people across the city of New York and the state of New York. So when we have, and we spoke about a variety of different things. We spoke about 421A, we spoke about the property tax cap, we spoke about CUNY, we spoke about the MTA. So it was a big, big cross-section of issues, and that's the beginning of a number of things that we will be doing. And where we agree, we'll be very clear. Where we disagree, we'll be very clear as well. On mayoral control, I chaired the Education Committee for five years and paid very close attention to the issue of mayoral control. Last year, without boring everyone to death, mayoral control was extended for one year. The governor has put in his budget an extension of mayoral control for three years. Certainly, the mayor would like to see it permanently extended, but has spoken about a number of seven years. He brought that up to me, certainly, when we were together. We were going to have hearings on mayoral control. 
They will be professional, they will be detailed, and they will be on topic. We send over $9 billion to the city of New York every year. And by the way, they deserve it. They need the money. But it's not unfair or unreasonable to ask the mayor why some of his proposals extend out to 2026, which essentially skips a generation of students right now. If it's good to do down the road, why can't it be done now? What's going on with failing schools? What's going on with uh, grade fixing scandals? Those are all questions that are appropriate, not only for the mayor, but for the chancellor. And I want the kids in the city of New York to have the same opportunity that my children have. So I believe in education, and the most important component of that is having an excellent teacher in front of the classroom. So what are we doing to recruit, retain, do professional development for teachers? That's all part of the discussion on mayoral control, and I believe that we will get there. So housing. Let me just touch on housing and I'll go back to that for a second. The affordable housing component, uh, the mayor has advanced a number of issues that we will vet in detail. And I mentioned Beth Garvey before. It's amazing to me how knowledgeable she is on housing in the city of New York. And that is going to be a critical issue. So I don't, I don't want to lose sight of that. I spoke to mayoral control and a permanent spending cap. And I'm going to do two last things. We take very seriously the work that we do, as I know everybody in this room does. And I want to put our best foot forward, not only on behalf of the Senate Republican Majority Conference, but I think if we do that and we do it properly, that's good for everybody in the state. Fundamentally, listening to the people that we represent and then acting appropriately and in a timely fashion. So I know we have a lot of work ahead of us. I'm very proud to be a public servant, very proud to be a senator, very humbled and privileged to be the Senate Majority Leader. I think we're going to have a very productive year. And we'll have, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of discussion along the way. But as Bill mentioned, uh, I, you knew I was going to bring it up, so you beat me to the punch. But I'm going to be unabashed. I have the green bracelet on. Organ donation. New York, there's 10,000 people in the metropolitan area waiting for transplants. Um, the, we are 50th in the country. We're progressive in a lot of areas, right? I don't like being dead last. And I wear this bracelet for a friend of mine, Jim Conte, a former assemblyman who was a double kidney transplant recipient. So if you forget everything else I said today, please become an organ donor. And if you work with an organization where you have employees, solicit your employees. Think about that. Of all the things you can do, this is probably the single most effective way to change somebody's life. You can actually save somebody's life. And by the way, it doesn't have to be post-mortem. You have the bone marrow registry. A lot of people's lives have been saved because of that. I spoke, and it was actually at Crane's. A gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, really appreciate what you said. I was a bone marrow donor, and now I've become very good friends with the gentleman who I donated my bone marrow to. He now has five, children's, uh, five children, and we travel together, and we're very good friends. So I'm just going to end on a very positive note, say thank you for your indulgence. And Mr. Rudin, I am happy to t the hard questions can go to Bill. I'll take the easy questions, all right? Thanks again. Open up to questions. There's a microphone heading your way, so wait, why don't you, and why don't you tell the leader who you are? Herb Pardis, uh, Executive Vice Chair at New York Presbyterian Hospital. I want to thank you for your enthusiasm and comments about organ donation because I share and many of the rest of us share your concern about it. Is there some prospect for doing something in the legislature this session which might advance that cause? It's, it's lagging, it needs your help, and <clears throat> the fact that you're there is wonderful. Right now, children under 18 are not allowed to become organ donors. So most kids get their license before they're 18. And because we now have an eight-year renewal on our licenses, we don't get a, a shot at these kids until they're like 25 or 26 years old. And I shouldn't say that. I don't mean a shot at these. I mean, just, we don't have... All right. <laughs> Kelly's going to kill me for that, all right? No, but my point is, you, you know exactly what I mean. And I think um, I've spoken to, in bringing this up, uh, a lobbyist for the property and casualty industry who spoke to me about this as an important issue to her and her organization. They want to help. So every one of you here can make a difference regardless of government intervention. And I'm hopeful that people will do that. 
All right, one, one more question. Go ahead. I know that your colleagues, Senator Lanza and Assemblymember Mallory Takas, have advanced a proposal to raise the maximum household income cap to restore TAP for graduate students. Uh, Senator Klein also has an idea for a low or a no-cost loan fund. So I'd like to get your thoughts about how we can make sure that higher education remains affordable and accessible for everybody. This is, this is easy. <laughs> it's easy to talk about. Getting it done is what actually makes the difference. And I got a couple of chancellors in the room, so I better say the right thing. Uh, we work with a variety of different colleagues. And Senator Laval is chair of the Higher Education Committee. And I can be unabashed in saying this, and he would be happy to know that I'm saying this. He is unrelenting, and I repeat, unrelenting on behalf of higher education. He cares about CUNY. He cares about SUNY. He cares about community colleges. And by the way, so do all of my colleagues. So access to TAP. Having TAP have a correlation to the cost of tuition. Having a rational tuition policy is monumentally important and extraordinarily helpful. My third child, my youngest child, people have heard me say this, he is my favorite child. Because <laughs> he is the only one of my three children that went to a SUNY school. Okay? <laughs> SUNY in the house, all right, there they are. Uh, but uh, all kidding aside, we um, investments in SUNY and CUNY, capital investments, infrastructure investments, I think one of the things that we've done very well and need to and do more of is making sure that we have great facilities, great classrooms, but we've got to remember, if we build all those things and we don't have good teachers or good professors, that's a problem. So affordability has been the hallmark of our conference's efforts in regard to public education. We are not going to walk away from that. Anything we do, and look, at the end of the day, we have competing priorities in the budget. Every time we put more money into education, it makes it more challenging to put money into, say, health care or environment or transportation or higher ed. When we do enact a budget with the executive and with the assembly, in essence, we're held accountable for that, and that's fine, because that compromise is a reflection of what are our priorities. I believe public education, in whatever way, shape, or form, particularly at the elementary and secondary level and a higher education level, um, is extraordinarily important. Chancellor Zimfer has been very outspoken about collaboration between elementary and secondary education, getting out of silos, making sure that we're having kids come to college, being college and career ready. All those things are important. But I, I think the Senate has been a leader at a minimum in that area. Leader Flanagan, thank you for coming here and being so open and honest. And uh, I think we look all forward uh, working with you and your colleagues to uh, deal with the issues that you've just laid out and many, many more. And I think, I think we all feel a lot better knowing uh, that uh, you are at the helm and working with uh, the governor and uh, the assembly and having such a, uh, a, a really uh, open door policy to discuss uh, all the issues. So thank you very, very much.